Hey there, today I am out at a tiny little cemetery in Pelham, Massachusetts to investigate a viewer request. A while ago, I got an email from someone named Eamon Voth saying that they had recently stumbled upon a headstone that I might be interested in. Eamon had been walking around this very cemetery here looking at graves when they noticed that one of the markers had kind of a strange inscription on it. An inscription that seemed to double as a murder accusation. And so today, I'm here to try and take a look at that stone. Eamon uh, couldn't recall exactly what the name on the grave was, but <laughs> that does not really matter. It's, it's kind of obvious which one they were telling me about once you actually get into the cemetery. Warren Gibbs supposedly died by arsenic poisoning way back in 1860. This is the stone that Eamon asked me to come and check out. And let me tell you, I am sure glad that they did. Because after I got that email, I did some research, I dug up some info, and I think I got quite the story for you. So how about we just start with this inscription here? I mean, that's what first caught Eamon's eye, so let's read it together. It says, Warren Gibbs died by arsenic poison on March 23rd, 1860. Think, my friends, when this you see, how my wife hath dealt by me. She in some oysters did prepare, some poison for my lot and share. Then of the same I did partake, and nature yielded to its fate. Before she, my wife became, Mary Felton was her name, erected by his brother, W. M. Gibbs. Wow, so uh, that's a pretty serious accusation, right? I mean, the Warren Gibbs headstone here is very clearly stating that Warren's wife poisoned him to death. So of course, the big question is, did she? <laughs> did Mary Felton actually poison her husband with an oyster dinner? Well, that is the main question that I wanna try and answer today. I want to walk you through all the info that I was able to uncover on this headstone. And I gotta say, right off the bat, there is a lot more here than you might think at first. Like, just to start, this is not the original headstone that was put up back in 1860. And if what I've read is true, then it's probably not even the second headstone put up, or the third, or the fourth, or fifth, because according to old legend, this headstone has been knocked down it's been stolen, it's been destroyed, it's maybe even been blown up with dynamite, depending on who you talk to. And, and each time, it's been replaced. For literally decades, a war has been fought over this stone. And I'm gonna tell you why in just a second. <laughs> but before I do, I feel like I better just tell you the basic factual story behind this gravestone, right? You know, just to set the foundation. So, let me clue you in using this article that I found in a 1906 edition of the Buffalo, New York commercial. This is one of the best summations of the backstory that I was able to find. It's got a ton of great details in it. Like, uh, for example, immediately this article calls the Warren Gibbs headstone a constant source of trouble for nearly 50 years and the cause of a bitter family feud. <laughs> so you know you're in for something good. Anyway though, here's the story. Long ago, in the early 19th century, two families, the Gibbs and the Feltons, both lived here in Pella, Massachusetts, and both really did not like each other. <laughs> they had a big time family drama going on, which was only made worse when Warren Gibbs decided to get engaged to Mary Felton, a sort of like Romeo and Juliet situation going on, right? And at first, despite the tension, the marriage actually seemed to be going okay. Until one day in 1860, when Warren got sick, like real sick, a heavy fever, and I guess he felt like his insides were burning up inside of him, just this horrible, intense thirst, so bad that he was calling out, begging for anybody to come and quench it. And so his neighbor heard that, I guess, and came over with a big jug of apple cider. Warren knocked that back, and. I guess the cider was so old that it had almost turned to vinegar and somehow the acid like calmed down Warren's inside. So he was starting to feel better. His appetite was back, his energy was up, and he asked Mary, his wife, to make him something for dinner. And before long, 
Here comes Mary out of the kitchen with a big old plate of oysters. And Warren dug right on into those oysters, ate a whole ton of them, and boom, before you know it, he is as sick as a dog again. This time, a doctor came over and did his best to help, but sadly, just a couple days after the oyster meal, poor Warren Gibbs was dead. And pretty much right away after his death, wasting no time at all, Warren's brother, William Gibbs, put in an order for a big old brand spanking new shiny white marble headstone formally accusing Mary Felton of poisoning Warren Gibbs with those oysters. And that white marble headstone is what this stone in the cemetery today was meant to replace. See, William Gibbs, Warren's brother, was absolutely positive that Mary must have poisoned those oysters, despite the fact that Mary's family and Mary herself were absolutely certain that she didn't. <laughs> And so now I'm sure you understand why this headstone was destroyed so many times, right? Like over and over, night after night, members of the Felton family would come sneaking into the cemetery with hammers and chisels bent on smashing up what they felt was a libelous gravestone. Things got so bad that eventually William even started like paying armed guards to watch over the stone at night. But even that wasn't enough. Like the stone was smashed and replaced and smashed and replaced for years and years and years until eventually memory of Warren and the headstone and the whole supposed poisoning incident just began to fade away. And now over a century and a half later, it sits here today, mostly safe, finally. <laughs> Although it did take quite a while to get to this point, because e even like well into the 20th century, when most people who actually knew Warren Gibbs were long dead, still this stone was in danger. Like uh, apparently for a while there in the 60s, students at nearby colleges used to like regularly steal the stone as kind of like a hazing ritual. And I guess in the 50s, a soldier stole it as some kind of prank. And <laughs> most interestingly, the headstone actually went missing for several like entire years back in the 1940s. You see, uh, most of the time when the headstone was stolen, it would end up getting recovered relatively recently, right? But in 1940, it went missing and then was gone for seven entire years before it was finally found by complete coincidence in the basement of some random house in a nearby town. I guess uh, somebody had just purchased that house and then they were renovating the basement and just the Warren Gibbs headstone was just in the basement for no reason. So I guess whoever the previous owner of the house was must have been the person responsible for stealing it, right? And whether it was a prank or a family member of Mary Felton trying to hide away the stone for good, we'll probably never know. But okay, uh, what about our big question? Did Mary Felton really kill Warren Gibbs intentionally? Does she really deserve to be accused of murder like this? Like, was this headstone actually justified? Well, as you might guess, we really only have kind of circumstantial evidence to base a conclusion on. Like, nobody ever tested the oysters for arsenic or performed an autopsy on Warren's body or anything like that. And beyond that type of thing, there's really like no way to prove with absolute certainty whether Mary killed Warren or not. But still, with that said, some of the circumstantial evidence that I was able to find is pretty intriguing. Like, for example, it really seems to me like most people who lived in Pelham back when Warren died were not exactly convinced that Mary had done anything nefarious to Warren. Like, uh, just to start, Mary was never actually charged with any crime. She, she never went to jail, she never stood trial, nothing. Like, she never faced any legal repercussions at all. So in the eyes of the law, Mary Felton is 100% absolutely innocent of poisoning Warren Gibbs, no question. But uh, even beyond that, even in like the, the court of public opinion, still the townsfolk really did not seem to think of Mary as much of a murderer. Like, here's a good example here. This newspaper in 1935 ran a story on the Gibbs gravestone where they actually got a quote from someone who used to live in Pelham when Warren died. And according to this guy, Warren's brother just kind of imagined the whole poisoning conspiracy. Like, I guess he already did not like Mary even before his brother died. 
and that bias just kind of led him to blame her with no real evidence. But uh, what's even more interesting than the opinion of like the general townsfolk is that not even all the other Gibbs family members agreed with the accusations. And, and in fact, one of them even married the newly widowed Mary Felton. <laughs> yeah, another of Warren Gibbs' own brothers even. So, so we got one brother who is killed by some oysters and then another brother who makes this headstone accusing his widow of murdering him and then a last brother that actually marries that widow. <laughs> kind of complicates things, right? Oh, and uh, by the way, in case you were wondering, the main reason that all these people kind of sided with Mary here is basically just that they thought the oysters were just spoiled. Like they were just old, bad oysters, which makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, Pelham is like 80 or 90 miles from the ocean. So how fresh could oysters have been back with 1860s transportation and refrigeration technology when they need to go that much of a distance? So. To me, it's not all that crazy that Warren was just sick from a fever and then ate some bad oysters and his, in his weakened state, he died from food poisoning, right? I also found a decent amount of stuff that just kind of like cast a bad projection of the character of Warren Gibbs too. Like a lot of stuff about how he was a, a shut-in and an addict and that he was reckless, whatever that means, and that he never had a job and he didn't take care of his five kids and none of his neighbors liked him. And I even found this one pretty crazy little article here where a guy wrote into his local newspaper to tell them that he thought the entire Gibbs family was rotten. Like he says the two brothers' dad was the meanest man in the whole country and that his sons, Warren Gibbs and William Gibbs, were pretty much just as cruel. And apparently the reason that he knows this is that his father-in-law, who actually knew the Gibbs, just never shut up about how bad and awful they were. <laughs> and that is just about where I thought I was gonna have to leave you. You know, with just some kind of vague musings from various townsfolk about whether Mary was guilty or not. You know, I had done my research and I thought I had found everything I could. And then, completely out of the blue, I stumbled upon the very best article that I found throughout the entire process. Like this was quite literally the last newspaper article that I found about this stone and it is one of the best and one of the most interesting. So this is a profile of the stone that was printed in the Boston Sunday Herald back in December of 1906. It is super extensive and it's got some great pictures of the stone and of the cemetery and a very detailed recounting of the story. And most critically, an interview with a guy named John Knights who lived in Pelham in 1860 and knew the Gibbs family personally. So this isn't even a guy whose father-in-law knew the Gibbs. No, this guy knew the family and he's got a lot to say. <laughs> For example, he actually says that Warren Gibbs himself was convinced that he had been poisoned. Like apparently while he was dying, he was telling everyone that he must have been drugged, which I'm sure contributed to how rabid his brother was about the whole poisoning thing, right? Oh, and uh, here's something that's kind of funny. The newspaper also asks Knights why there was never a formal investigation into the murder charge. <laughs> and Knights just kind of shrugs and says, probably would have been too expensive. <laughs> but uh, as, uh, as interesting and funny as those little details are, far and away, the single most important little tidbit in Knights' interview is what he says about the doctor. Knights actually specifically claims that Warren Gibbs' doctor that was watching over him as he was dying said himself that the oysters had probably spoiled and that's what poisoned Warren, which is pretty concrete, right? Like, 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 like I said at the top of the video, short of an autopsy or a confession, there's really like nothing anybody could ever find to confirm for sure whether or not Warren Gibbs was poisoned, but this is about as close as you can get, right? Like his own doctor 
stinks, that it was just spoiled oysters, that, that that's kind of hard to argue against, right? Uh, like, especially when you add in all that other stuff about the rest of the town's opinion and how far the oysters had to travel to get to Pelham and how not even all of the Gibbs family wanted to blame Mary. So like, like I'm not gonna call this mystery solved or anything, but personally, I feel like I'm on Mary's side. Which uh, <laughs> sort of leaves this headstone in a weird place, doesn't it? Like it is, it's quite possible and maybe even probable that this is a 160 year old piece of libel carved into a rock, right? So uh, before I came out here, I was like thinking a lot about how I wanted to close this video, right? And at first I wanted to make like a big speech about how it must have felt for Mary and her family to spend the rest of their lives with like a big block of stone sitting here making up lies about Mary and how, and how like Mary constantly in the back of her head for the rest of her life, no matter where she goes and what she does and who she meets, she knows somewhere in the world, tucked away in the woods is a headstone that her brother-in-law is guarding with a shotgun that says, that she killed her husband. <laughs> like, it's gotta be a unique experience to live through, right? But especially now that I'm here, I don't think I can quite work up the energy for that speech, just cause we're still not 100% certain whether Warren was intentionally poisoned or not, right? I mean, I think he wasn't, and I think Mary's innocent, and I'm sure most of you probably think that now too, but still, it's a little bit too up in the air for me to get all excited about it. So instead, how about we close out this video with something different? You see, a few of the articles that I found on the stone here mentioned a little detail that kind of caught my eye. Apparently, right after the Warren Gibbs stone had been recovered out of that guy's basement back in 1947, after it had gone missing for seven years, the local Pelham Historical Society decided that they had better take action. And so, they took the stone out of the cemetery and brought it to the Historical Society for safekeeping and put up this replica stone instead. I even found this like great article about the guy that they commissioned to make the new stone. Pretty cool, right? <laughs> Although it does kind of make things confusing because like if the legends are true and the first few stones kept getting destroyed, then wasn't the one that was here in 1940 that got stolen already a replica? So this is like a replica of a replica? <laughs> I don't know, but, but either way, I thought it might be cool to see if the historical society still had that stone that got stolen. So I sent him an email and long story short, There we go. That is the Warren Gibbs headstone that was sitting in that random basement in a random house for seven years. Pretty awesome, right? The uh, guy from the Pelham Historical Society that got back to me was uh, named Bruce, and he was kind enough to take time out of his day to show me the Historical Society Museum here with the stone and also show me a couple other cool things. Like, for example, right next to the building with the headstone in it is the oldest town meeting house in the United States that still is used for meetings. Like, I guess every single year, the town of Pelham makes sure to hold at least one small 15 minute little meeting in the meeting house so that they can hold on to their record. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? And check this out. The pews in this building in the back of the meeting house, they have all these scratch marks on them, right? And Bruce told me that those were actually done by children with jackknifes while they were bored listening to the town sermons. <laughs> All right, but that's about it for me. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you've got any cool legends or stories in your hometown, shoot me an email, leave me a comment. I'd love to hear about them. Doesn't even have to be in New England, can be anywhere. I wanna know. Hope you enjoyed the video. See you next time.